We must have a high view of God's word. It's got the power to deliver the depressed and the oppressed. It's got the power to restore relationships. The power to save souls and save the sin. It's got the power to defeat the devil. Make one wise. Renew one's mind. Shape one's worldview. And direct one's life. Listen to me. The word of God is all sufficient. Again, it's the ultimate weapon. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity. Father, I pray that that you would just help us to focus on your word and nothing else. Father, your word and nothing else. Speak to us, each one, in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to read from uh, a little bit from 1 Samuel 17. Uh, we're going to be studying the story of, of David and Goliath. And, and I'm going to be sharing. And so if you want to just keep uh, 1 Samuel 17 open, that'd be the best way because we'll be hitting different scriptures as we do this. But we're going to start in verse 23. And, and trust me, we're going to cover this, this story, but uh, I, I want to just give you a little bit of the context of what the Bible says about it. And in, in verse 23, it says this, As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, came out from the Philistine ranks. And David heard him shout his usual taunt, to the army of Israel. As soon as the Israelite army saw him, they began to run away in fright. Have you seen the giant? The men asked. He comes out each day to defy Israel. Have you seen the giant? You know, this conference is about servant leaders, how we minister, how we live. And how we minister and how we live is we face giants every day. Every day we face giants in our families, we face giants in our ministries, we face giants in our work. And these men, as they were, as they were representing the, God's country, as they were re representing Israel, they were challenged by a giant. And, and they were overwhelmed. And so I want to I look at what, what God did in that. Today. And the first thing that I saw was that there was a man named David who was obedient to the task. David was obedient to the task. If you look in verse 17 to 22, it says this, One day Jesse said to David, Jesse is David's father, Take this basket of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread and carry them quickly to your brothers. And give these ten cuts of cheese to the captain and see how your brothers are getting along and bring back a report on how they are doing. David's brothers were with Saul and the Israelite army in the valley of Etha, Elah, fighting against the Philistines. So David left the sheep with another shepherd and set out early the next morning with the gifts as Jesse had directed him. And he arrived at the camp just as the Israelite army was leaving for the battlefield with shouts and battle cries. Soon the Israelite and Philistine forces stood facing each other, army against army. And David left his things with the keeper of the supplies and hurried out to the ranks to greet his brothers. I want you to see a few things in, in the beginning of this story. Um, David was asked by his father to take a meal to his family. So he was back home. He was guarding their, or taking care of the sheep, and everyone else in the family was representing Israel. And David was back doing what the family needed him to do. And his dad asked him to do something. He said, hey, I have this task for you. And it, it, it seems like a pretty simple task. Take lunch to your brothers. Right? Maybe somebody here today has been asked to go get lunch for the Servant Leaders Conference. Hey, I, I need you to go get lunch. And you're like, wow, get lunch? Couldn't anybody do that, right? Couldn't anybody do that? But that was the task he was asked to do. And what did he do? It says he left immediately. He took his stuff. He, he made sure somebody could care for what his job was, and then he left immediately. He, he went and did what he was was told to do. And not only that, it says that when he got there, what did he do? He didn't just lay everything down and then run over to the battle. No, it says he gave the provisions to the proper person. He completed the task he was asked to do. He completed it faithfully, in time, on time. 
He was obedient to what his father asked him to do. He did every detail of that task. And then, once the task was complete, he turned his attention to something bigger. Brothers and sisters, I think sometimes we turn our attention to something bigger before we complete the task we've been assigned to do. I, I think we, we want to move up. We want to get the next level. We want to do the next thing, the bigger thing, the thing that, that's a little more visible, that's a little more special, that, that fills our bucket a little more. And brothers and sisters, I, I see from the life of David that he fulfilled every thing that he was asked to do, every task. doesn't matter the size, doesn't matter the importance. He fulfilled the task obediently, on time, and in the proper way. It was complete. There was nothing left. Somebody was watching the sheep. Brothers got the meal. The proper man got it. And then he turned his attention to something else. You must be obedient to what you're asked to do. What is God asking you? Sometimes it seems so small. Sometimes it seems insignificant. Sometimes it seems like, well, well can't he do it or she do it? Not if God called you to do it. Brothers and sisters, we need to be obedient to the task. The next thing that I see in this story of David was that, that he was outraged by the defiance of Goliath. He was outraged. It says in verse 26, David asked the soldier standing nearby, what will a man get for killing this Philistine and ending his defiance of Israel? Who is this pagan Philistine anyway that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? Man, he is upset, isn't he? Now, what was everybody else? Everybody else was doing what? <gasps> Have you seen the giant? Man, he's big. And he's saying these things. And is anybody challenging what he's saying? No. Now, let me be clear about something. God can handle doubters. All right? It's not our job to go and, and, and pick every fight when, when there's a doubter. I, I'm not trying to say that. When you hear somebody saying something bad about God. I'm not saying, oh, we just have to go challenge them. But what I am saying is that it's refreshing to see David passionate about God. I think it's refreshing to see somebody passionate about the name of God. I think sometimes that we let that go. We don't, we, we don't challenge it. And again, I'm not saying in an ugly way. This past week I heard somebody saying something and I said, ooh, that's a little rough. That's all I said. It's a little rough. And, and it, it stops people. They, they have to think through what they're talking about. That's what David's doing here. He's like, what, what? Is anybody bothered by what this guy's saying? You all stand around here. You run away. Listen to what he's saying. He's not saying that about you. He's saying that about God. Isn't anybody here Worried about that? Doesn't anybody care about that? David has a passion for God's name. I think we need to have a passion as leaders for God's name. I think that's important for us. We need to be passionate about his name and how we use it, how we represent it, how we live it, how we act it out. And then David began in this story, David began to remember God's faithfulness. David remembered God's faithfulness. In verse 33, it says this. The king is talking to David. David goes to the king and says, you know what? I'll fight that guy. You got nobody else here. Everybody else is afraid. I'll fight him. And the king responds with these words of encouragement. Don't be ridiculous. <laughs> that was what his leader told him. So you go to your pastor, you say, Pastor, I'm going to take over the kids' ministry. He looks at you and says, oh, don't be ridiculous. <laughs> right? Right? That's what's happening here. He says, I'll take care of that. I'll, I'll take that challenge. I'll take that giant. And he says, don't be ridiculous. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. Again, what a way to build this guy. Way to coach him up, man. There's no way you can do this. You're a boy, and he's a man. 
He's a man of war since youth. But David persisted. I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. When a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I have done this to lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. God remember, or David remembered God's faithfulness. Who does he say helped him? God. He said, I fought a bear and I fought a lion. <laughs> this guy, nothing. This is nothing. Because God is faithful when there is something coming against me. And you know, as I share that and I begin to think about that, I want to ask you, what experience do you have of God's faithfulness? What is the experience you have had of God's faithfulness? When did you club a bear or a lion to death? Not literally. But when did you have that victory in your life? When did you know God is with me? When were you doing something and you knew with beyond a shadow of a doubt, God is in this for me? Think about that. See, that's where David's at right now. He sees a challenge and he says, you know what? In the past, God has always been with me. In the past, God has always delivered me. God is not changing. This is a giant. I am going to defeat it. Because God is faithful. Not because I can kill bears and lions. No, because God can kill bears and lions. That's why I know I can take care of this giant. So let me ask you this. I just asked you, what experience do you have of God's faithfulness? Can it happen again? See, I think some of us get stuck. This is a big time of... of um, March Madness and basketball and, and they play a big tournament and, and the way it happens is you play the game and if you lose, you're done. It's called one and done. Is, is God's faithfulness a one and done in your life? Is that where you're at with your faithfulness? Are you, are, are you at the point where you say, you know what, God, God did a crazy, miraculous thing in my life, so that's it. Uh, he, he's not going to be there again. I, I've spent my coin. I, I've got my faith. I've got my miracle. So, so that's it. The, the rest of them are for somebody else. See, I think sometimes we, we forget God's faithfulness is active every day of our lives. And it continues on. And God wants to do that over and over again. And sometimes we get to the point where we, well, we already got that. As leaders, we have to see that God was faithful in the last thing. God's going to be faithful in this thing. Because sometimes, here's what happens. God, God kills this massive giant in our life, and we come up, and there's another one, but it's not as big. But when we look at it, and we remember we fought a giant, this one seems bigger. And we say, here it is again. <laughs> Just can't get victory over these giants. I guess I better look for something else to do. I better, I better go try something different. And I'm telling you, God is faithful. If God helped you with the lion, if God helped you with the bear, He'll help you with the giant that's standing in front of you right now. Amen. Right? The fact is, it can happen again. It can happen again. It will happen again, but it depends on your faith. The next thing I... I see in this story is that David didn't change to fit expectations. David didn't change to fit expectations. In verse 38 it says this, Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet, a coat of mail. He, David put it on, strapped the sword over it, and took a step or two to see what it was like, for he had never worn such things before. That's a key. He had never worn such things before. 
I can't go in these, he protested to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off again. He wasn't used to wearing armor. He wasn't used to wearing armor. See, it wasn't who he was. Don't try to be who you're not. Just don't try to be who you're not. Don't, don't, don't car, cave into expectations of other people. That's, that's a big challenge for people, especially new leaders. They, they try to be like their pastor or like somebody on TV or like somebody they've read about. They, they try to, to fit some mold that's been placed upon them. I mean, I've had all kinds of different challenges in life. I, I wrote a few down here. Um, some people say, hey, you should never preach with notes. Some people say, you should always preach with notes. You know what? Do what feels good to you. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you preach with notes, you don't preach with notes. Should you wear a tie? Should you wear jeans? Does it matter? I'm saying it doesn't. Wear what feels comfortable to you. Wear what, wear what makes the people you're ministering to feel comfortable. If that's a tie, wear a tie. If it's a suit, wear a suit. If it's a pair of shorts, wear shorts. Minister to the people. Be who you are. KJV versus NLT. Woo. God's version, not God's version. Which one is it? Does it matter? Is it the Bible? Preach it. Preach it. Teach it. Know it. Share it. Right? Doesn't matter. Don't conform to what somebody else tells you to do. Just be you. God called you to the ministry. God wants to use you. Don't try to be someone else. Don't try to be someone else. David faced the giant. That's the fifth thing I saw, is that David faced the giant. It says in verse 41, Goliath walked out towards David with his shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. Am I a dog, he roared, that you come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here. I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals, Goliath yelled. And David replied to the Philistine, You come at me with sword, spear, and javelin. Now think about that. Here's a little guy standing there with a stick and a couple of rocks in his hands. And there's a guy in full armor, nine feet tall, with a sword and a javelin and an armor bearer. And David says, you come at me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Who's got the power now? Right? Who's got the power now? David is standing in the power of God. Let me ask you a few things. Was David the only person that heard Goliath shout at the, at the army? No, he wasn't, was he? Everyone heard him shouting, didn't they? Who's standing there in front of him right now? David. Did, did all the, the special expert, probably the, the seal unit, did they hear him shouting the taunts? The seal unit of Israel? Yes, they heard him taunting Israel. And were they standing there? No. David is standing there. David was the only one to face his giant. Are you willing to face your giant? Sometimes you might be the only one that will face the giant. No one else in the church will stand beside you. But someone has to face it. Why was he doing it? He was facing it because he believed that God would stand with him. What giant exists in your life right now? What giant exists in the life of your church right now? Or maybe giants. Maybe there should be an S on that word. 
What's there? Write it down. Get a piece of paper. Write it down. What giant's there? I'm asking you if you've heard the giant. I'm asking you if the giant is taunting you. I'm asking you if you've seen the giant. I'm asking you if you're standing in front of the giant and willing to face it. Because David faced his giant. Who, what else? What did the rest of the army do? They hid behind the tents. So are you standing and facing your giant or are you hiding behind the tents? Because that's a key right now. That's a key to your ministry. That's a key to your calling. You can't continue with God if you're hiding behind the tents. You must face the giant. And you must face the giant in the power of the armies of heaven. So then, the next thing that I see in this is that David utilized his unique gifts and abilities. See, I told you before, don't conform. Don't, don't conform to what everybody else wants. Be you. And that's what I see in David. In verse 49, it says this, Reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone, he hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. And the stone sank in. And Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. He had no sword, he had no spear, he had no armor. Sometimes when in leadership, sometimes when you're called to a ministry, sometimes when you're called to a task, you feel like you don't have everything you need. You have no sword. You have no spear. You have no shield. You have no armor bearer. You feel unworthy for the task. You feel unprepared for the task. You feel that, that it shouldn't be you. Why me, Lord? I'm telling you it's because God gifted you with unique gifts and abilities. And you're standing there with exactly what you need to defeat your giant. Because you're standing there in the power of the Holy Spirit. And you're standing there in the, the unique way that God created you to face your giant. He had a sling and he had five rocks. The other guy had a spear and a javelin and a sword. But here's the key. David knew how to use a sling. David knew how to use a sling. Do you know how to use the gifts and abilities you have? Do you? Do you even know the gifts and abilities you have? That's important. It's important to find out the way God has gifted you. And then, be an expert. Be an expert at that. If you're gifted to preach, then be a preaching expert. And if you're a preaching expert, don't try to fix the electricity in the church. Right? Because <laughs> you're not an expert there. Because <laughs> that is not how God gifted you. And that might be the way you go and meet Jesus. <laughs> right? <laughs> See, sometimes we try to do all these different things. And I'm telling you, know how to use your sling. Know how to use your sling. The last thing I noticed in this story is that David gave the glory to God. David gave all the glory to God. Verse 45, today the Lord will conquer you. That's what he said to this giant, this giant that is facing him with a sword and a javelin and a spear. He looks at him in the eye and he says, Today the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you and cut off your head. But, but do you hear the, the progression there? Who's going to conquer the giant? The Lord. The Lord is going to conquer the giant. David's just going to clean it up. See, the Lord is going before him. The Lord is, is who he is standing there in the name of the Lord. 
He says, and I will kill you, I will cut off your head, and then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. This, this is the Lord's battle, and he will give it to us. You see that? It's not because we have more military might than you. It's not because we have more weapons than you. It's not because we're smarter than you. It's because we have God. And that's why he will conquer you. Because greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. You're standing in front of your giant. The battle is done. You just have to be faithful. So he killed the giant. He won the victory. And when he did that, it would have been pretty easy to go, yeah, that was me. <laughs> I'm David. That's me. I killed the giant right over there. Yeah, see that? Yeah, that was me. That was all me. Do you see the way I... You want to take a picture? That's, it would have been easy, right? You've been there. You do something cool and people start to, ooh, great job, brother, great job, sister. Ooh, you knocked out of the park. You, yeah, it kind of did. Kind of did. Yeah. <laughs> you, you take a little of that glory, don't you? Not David. No. He says, this is the Lord's battle and he will give it to us. It's all about God. It's all about God. This giant, it's all about God. God called me to do something. What did God call me to do? He called me to take lunch to my brother's. You remember that? That was his call. Take lunch to your brothers. And he did that. He was faithful in that. And then God opened up a window. He saw another opportunity to serve God. And when he did that, he went forward in the power of God. You know, I'm telling you that God made you unique. God made you with your own gifts and your own abilities and your own strengths and your own weaknesses. All of those things, that's what you have. That's the unique creation of God. He made you. And so I'm asking you to be faithful to use what God gives you. You know, just before I came up, I was asked, uh, I think Danny asked me, hey, are you ready? And uh, I said, I'm going to share something about that. Um, when I first started speaking, I was so nervous. Oh, man, I tell you what. I could barely talk. My wife could see it immediately. Sometimes people would say they didn't see it, but, oh, man, I was scared. I was so scared. I hated it. To go in front of a group and speak. I hated it. Now I love it. It energizes me. It fills my bucket. But I hated it. And I didn't want to do it. I never wanted to do it. I would always pray that somebody else would speak. When I'd be sitting there, somebody would call me to speak, I'd be sitting there like, oh, please send somebody else in like a more famous guy. And then right at the end, the pastor would see him and say, hey, hey, would we get Billy Graham up here instead? You know, that was always what I wanted. I always wanted that. And, you know, and, and so I, and I was challenged by that because God was really taking me out to the woodshed on that. He'd be like, I called you to do this. I called you to preach. I, I gave you these gifts. And so one day when I was reading and studying, I was just really kind of wrestling with God. And, and I'm not kidding. He just pointed me to Exodus 4. And every time I preached, I would go to Exodus 4. And for a while, for, for one time, one season, I must have preached 60 times when we were on a missions tour. And I must have spoke 60 times in about three months. And every time, I'm not kidding you, every time I read this while I was sitting in the pew while they were doing the welcome and stuff because I was scared. And this is what I would read. But Moses pleaded with the Lord. Exodus 4, verse 10. But Moses pleaded with the Lord. Lord, I'm not very good with words. I've never been. 
and I'm not now, even though you've spoken to me. I get tongue-tied and my words get tangled. And here's, here's what the Lord says. The Lord asked Moses, Who makes a person's mouth? Who decides whether people speak or do not speak? Who decides whether a person hears or does not hear? Whether a person sees or does not see? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go. Now go. I will be with you as you speak, and I will instruct you what to say. Seems awfully clear, right? Who is speaking? The Lord. Who gives you that ability? The Lord. To give the glory to God. Give the glory to God. When you face your giant, when you have that victory, when you have that opportunity, when you have that ministry and it's going well, give glory to God because who are you? You're an instrument in the hand of of the King of kings and Lord of lords. You're an instrument in the hand of the Almighty. The power of God is sufficient. Face your giant because God is enough. God is enough. Let's pray. Father, I thank you once again for, for your word. I, I thank you for what you shared with us. Father, I ask that we would have the courage to identify our giants. Because everyone heard the giant. Everyone heard him. Everyone knew he was there. No one was willing to face him. Father, I pray that everyone in this room would not only hear their giant, but they would listen to what their giant is saying, and they would step forward, and they would face their giant in the power of the Holy Spirit. And Father, that as they do, you would fill them with your spirit and the victory would be yours. In Jesus' name, amen.